Let's talk about vitamin E. What exactly is vitamin E? Now, it was discovered in 1922, and if we kind of look at what vitamin E is. Vitamin E is a mixture of different compounds called tocopherols. So you may see this on a supplement bottle, <clears throat> which is why I'm even talking about it, but it's also uh, a family of chemicals called tocotrienols. And so there's basically, there's an alpha, beta, delta, and gamma version of these two. So think of vitamin E as not one vitamin, think of it as a family of eight different compounds kind of all together, right? And so most people, when they're talking about vitamin E, what they're really referring to is alpha tocopherol. So if you um, come across that term, you ever see that term alpha tocopherol on a supplement label, that generally is what they're referring to is vitamin E, although technically it's not the comprehensive complete form of vitamin E. So it's important to know when you're looking, so like if you're in the market and you're shopping and you're trying to find, okay, what is a good solid source of tocopherols or a vitamin E, you're going to look for mixed tocopherols and kind of as a bare minimum, let me slide this over for just a minute. You're looking for, again, mixed and you want to see the alpha, the beta, the gamma, and the delta version. So if you're looking at a supplement bottle, if you don't see all four of those, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, then that's not really a comprehensive mixture for vitamin E. Now, the most active form of vitamin E is the alpha. And this is why, you know, this is when we're talking about measuring vitamin E levels and doctors prescribing vitamin E. This is the one that most commonly, you know, it's the primary one that's used. But the more we learn about this family of tocopherols, tocotrienols, the more we realize that it's all important. So not just focusing on alpha. Now, it's also important to understand when you're looking for a vitamin E, there's an L form or rather a DL form, and then there's a, a D form of vitamin E. And so you want the D form, the D version. This is natural. And why does it matter? Because the synthetic version, aside from being synthetic, it's not as effective. So it doesn't work as well as the natural form of vitamin E. So you really want to make sure that when you're, again, when you're shopping, you're looking, if you're trying to supplement with vitamin E, look for the D version. Don't look for the DL version synthetic, look for something with mixed tocopherols, and generally it will say that. It will say alpha tocopherol with mixed tocopherols, indicating that it has alpha, beta, gamma, and delta versions of vitamin E. Now, if you're trying to eat more in your diet, let's talk about some of the foods that really that you want to try to gravitate toward. And we're going to talk about a couple of different things around food in just a minute, but gluten, and, these are gluten and grain-free foods. Obviously, you've been listening to me for any period of time. You know, I'm the author of No Grain, No Pain. And so we do things grain free around here. If that's new to you, you might want to pick up your copy. But gluten and grain free sources of vitamin E. And these are listed in order of think of this as greatest quantity to least quantity. So sunflower seeds, almonds, hazelnuts, pine nuts, Brazil nuts, tomato sauce, cranberry, apricot, avocado, fish, predominantly trout and salmon, but your fatty fish. Again, this is what we're going for because it's generally where we're going to find vitamin E. Remember, vitamin E is a fat-soluble vitamin. There's four of them, fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K. And generally where we seek to look for them and find them in our diets is through eating fattier foods. And so this applies as well to vitamin E. If you look at some of the best sources, they're nuts or seeds because these tend to have more fat, right? So that's where that vitamin E is living. But also liver, eggs, spinach, and then butternut squash, asparagus, chard, bro broccoli, and blackberries, all good sources of dietary vitamin E. So there was a study done not too long ago that showed that up to 90% of people in the United States don't get adequate vitamin E in their diets on a daily basis. So again, you can do your part by just incorporating some of these healthier foods into your diet to get some vitamin E. Okay, now if we look at symptoms over here, symptoms of vitamin E deficiency, 
And I'm, some of these things I bring up because these are super common symptoms. Think about it like this muscle pain, muscle weakness, okay? Some of the most common reasons why people go to see a doctor are because of muscle pain, right? So this is very, very common, muscle pain and muscle weakness. Now, additionally, a difficulty walking, and this is, you know, can be construed as a loss of balance. Some people refer to this as ataxia. So if you've heard your doctor mention that word to you, if you've ever been diagnosed with cerebellar ataxia, um, these are cue-ins to you to ask your doctor to test you for a vitamin E deficiency. Because if you have these things, there's a reason why. And one of the more, one, I won't say one of the most common reasons for these problems is vitamin E, but it is not a, it's not an uncommon reason. I see vitamin E deficiency on a very regular basis in my nutritional practice. And so again, uh, you want to be aware that these are some of the symptoms of that vitamin E deficiency, muscle pain. And again, this is non-traumatic. So it's not like, you know, when I say muscle pain of non-trauma, so you didn't, non-injury, so you didn't pick up an injury. So it's not like you trained too hard or you tripped and fell. We're talking about non-traumatic muscle pain or weakness. So you didn't, you know, again, you didn't injure yourself per se, and you don't quite know why that pain is there. That's a cue in to ask your doctor about testing for vitamin E deficiency. Nerve damage, neuropathy, and I mentioned ataxia up here too, but ataxia is a form of neuropathy, which is why it's listed under nerve damage or neuropathy. So again, if you've had a diagnosis of something called cerebellar ataxia, you want to talk to your doctor about vitamin E. And then visual disturbances, it's retinopathy. So somebody the other, a couple of weeks ago was asking me about nutrients and retinopathy or retinal tearing. And although we can't really say that vitamin E deficiency leads to retinal tearing, we know it leads to retinopathy, meaning damage of the retina. And so visual disturbances are sometimes the way that's manifested. And so you go to an eye doctor, get an eye checkup. He says, oh, you have a retinopathy. After he looks in your eye, next question should be, hey doc, is there a vitamin E deficiency potentially that's contributing to that? Can you test my levels? That would be the smart thing to do. And then additionally, anemia. But what are the symptoms of anemia? So what is it, what, what really is anemia? Let's kind of break that down a little bit more. The symptoms of anemia, because many people think iron deficiency, and that's not what we're referring to. There's a specific type of anemia that comes along with vitamin E. It's called hemolytic anemia. And so what happens when your red blood cells... And if we look at the shape of a red blood cell here, red blood cells are like a little disc, like a, almost like a circle that's been squished. And inside, they have that protein hemoglobin. And what happens is oxygen is carried in that little divot, in that concavity, in that red blood cell. And so what happens with a hemolytic anemia is these cells... The cell wall is damaged really easy, and so they tend to split or rupture. And so when red blood cells rupture too quickly, it's, that's what they call hemolytic anemia. And so there's some blood tests, some basic blood tests your doctor can order to kind of define whether or not you have a hemolytic anemia. Again, it's not going to look like an iron deficiency anemia on a blood test. So we're not looking at your hemoglobin or your hematocrit. Again, these are just markers for iron deficiency anemia or even your iron levels to try to determine whether or not you have this kind of anemia. So it's important to understand if it doesn't present on a lab test and most doctors aren't trained in nutrition to analyze you know, a hemolytic anemia as it relates to vitamin E, it's best if we understand the symptoms of anemia, right? So what are the symptoms of anemia? So again, if you have these symptoms, this is where you want to, again, kind of suspect this might be a possibility for you. So the symptoms would be shortness of breath. Okay. Going back to what we said earlier, muscle fatigue. More than muscle pain, although muscle fatigue can lead to muscle pain, where your muscles wear out, even after something really small and really easy. So maybe you walk a few stairs and your muscles are starting to get tired too quickly. Short, so shortness of breath, muscle fatigue. You feel like you can't catch your breath even though you're, you're not exerted, but you feel exerted. Like these are some of the symptoms 
uh, of anemia. And then just overwhelming fatigue in general, not even just muscle fatigue, but just fatigue. You have a hard time staying awake. You're yawning a lot. You feel like you can't fill your lungs up. You've got a lot of brain fog. So these are all symptoms potentially of an anemia. And again, remember, there are different kinds of anemia. Iron deficiency anemia can cause the same symptoms as a vitamin E deficiency anemia. It's just that they look different on lab work. So again, it's, it's, if you have these symptoms, you suspect anemia, your doctor tells you that he, after measuring your iron that it's just fine, you might want to consider asking them to measure your vitamin E and making sure you don't have a hemolytic anemia. So again, these are some of the main symptoms of vitamin E deficiency. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.